Well, good morning, church. Is it well with you? Are you happy? Good, because I don't want to preach to people that aren't happy. I want you to be. If you're not happy by the end, then that, I didn't. I did my job. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Conviction. I'm just kidding. Thank you, babe. Man, I'm in love with you too. All the children are out now, so I can say what I want. <laughs> he says, "Careful." He always feels that I, I get a little bit in trouble. Jason and I have we've been we've been we were high school sweethearts. We met when we were 16 years old. He started parking beside me with his car, and it was all downward spiral from there. <laughs> Truth is, I parked beside him and then came up to him in school and said, why do you keep parking beside me? He said, I don't park beside you. I'm always here first. I was definitely the person who was running late all the time. I barely got in for the bell. So he was always there. His car was always there, and I'd come up to him about halfway through the day, and I'd say, man, I am really sick of you trying to park by me. And I did that for four or five days, and I think he got enough confidence that he thought, I could actually talk to this girl. And uh, we had a great conversation after that. And uh, I will never forget, I've told you this before, but I'll never forget when Jason and I started dating. We were really young, and, and you know, he was so, Jason is such a thoughtful man. If, if you know him, he's very thoughtful. He was that way even when we were younger. And um, he would say things to me like, I just look forward to the day that I can marry you. I just look forward to the day that you could be my wife. And I would be so not good back because I would say, you shouldn't talk that way. I, there's no guarantees here. Right now, this is, like, this is like free meal territory right now. Like we're not there yet. And, I, and he kept coming back. This is all true, isn't it, honey? It's all true. And he kept coming back. And, but yet at the same time, when I did fall for him, I fell pretty hard. And then there was no recovery for me. So I thought I better marry this dude because I sure do love him and love hanging out with him. Well, are you ready for the word today? Um, so how many of you came to the picnic last week? You made it to the picnic? Woohoo! Our picnic was great, wasn't it? Well done, everyone. Well done. I thought it was just fantastic. This week we have our picnic again going on. Of course, many of our children are traveling this afternoon, but those of you that can come out, we're at War Memorial Park. We can't wait to see you. We think it's going to be a great day. What beautiful weather in August we've had. Amen. Beautiful weather. I have the opportunity to continue our one-month series on relationships. Last week, if you didn't have an opportunity to, to log on or to be part of the identity, I talked about identity. This week, I want to take it a little bit deeper. I want to talk about, and it's so funny because I did these in advance. I've, I like to be prepared. So the guys here will know that I send out the series that I'm going towards most of the time two or three months in advance because everything I speak on, I'm trying to lead us somewhere. I want to get us somewhere. So when I put pressure on myself about making sure I get us there. And uh, I sent this particular subject a few months ago. And I really believe just in the condition of the world and where we're at. It's a subject you don't hear very often people address. But it's something I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the restoration of relationship wrecks. The restoration of relationship wrecks. What does it mean to have a relationship wreck? And I want to talk about the places in our life that we face, that every relationship faces. Every relationship faces the things I'm going to talk about today. Now, no matter if you're married, if you're single, if you got a coworker, if you got a child, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're down the grocery store and you become best friends with the cashier, it doesn't matter where they're at, you have the opportunity in these three things to particularly be able to identify how to handle a relationship. So I want to do that. Would you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3? Colossians chapter 3. And when you get there, you can stand for the reading of the word. That would be great. Thank you. Colossians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. It's going to come up on the screen. But if you just stand with me as soon as you arrive at Colossians chapter 3. Now I'm going to read a really long passage of scripture and come back around to it throughout this time for the next few minutes. So just bear with me for a moment. This is now Paul speaking and he says this. If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ is, for he seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is now hidden with God. 
When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. And he names what those are. Fornication, uncleanliness, passion, and evil desire, covetedness, all of which are idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. In other words, people who just won't listen. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived among them. But now, isn't that good news? But now you yourselves are to put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And you have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, slave nor free, but Christ all in all. Therefore, how many of you know when you see the word therefore, that means everything I just said led you to this moment. Everything that Paul just said, he wanted to get to, to be said so he could set you up for this. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, put on kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must forgive. But above all, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Lord, thank you for the ability to preach and teach today. I'm grateful that you use my voice to communicate your word. I thank you, Lord, that you'll put me on like a coat and wear me and let Holy Spirit, you speak through me like never before. Let your words not fall to the ground, but let them produce, let them take root. And Lord, let us water upon seeds that have already been planted and let great harvest come from it. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. I want to just speak as... I know we have a picnic and so I don't want to belinger, but I want to just take some time because I think one of the things that we all need to understand right away is that God is a God who is interested in one primary thing. And I talked about this last week and I want to make sure I recover it. God is interested in one primary thing and that is reconciliation. God is interested in reconciliation. Out of all things that God could be interested in your life, he is most interested in reconciliation. The cross in and of itself proves that. Everything about the Lord proves that. Everything he did in scripture proves that he has been bringing us to a point of reconciliation. In fact, the one book of the Bible that gives us what we don't call miracles, what we call signs, is the book of John. The book of John's interesting because it takes a different approach from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And though it repeats some of the same stories, it never repeats them in the same fashion. And the reason is, is because John wanted you to see something different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That doesn't discredit Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It simply means that John wanted to give you a, a different view on the progression of Jesus on the earth. And the view he wanted to leave with us was the view that everything Jesus did does is not about a random miracle. God is not random. Whenever you think about random things and you start saying, man, God just did that randomly. Untrue. It may have been random to you, but it was not random to God. God is not random. God is purposeful. Everything that he does is in alignment with what he wants to do and what he sees in you of your potential. Every incident in your life is leading you to a place that God can use. That's why all things can work together for good. That means bad things that have happened in your life, God can turn around because he's already known the end of the story from the beginning of the story. So no matter what you're facing, no matter what's happened in your life, no matter what's gone on in your life, you always can know that he is on a road that's taking you to a place in victory. Isn't that good news? It's good news because like John said, he said, there are signs that Jesus left us along the way that help us better understand what he has been doing this whole time. 
I was talking to Scott uh, this week because I like to get with these guys and talk about Bible stuff, and it just, that kind of stuff geeks me up. I just love doing stuff like that. I love grappling over scripture, and, and I love doing it in different ways. And I was speaking with Scott, and we were talking about the book of John because it's by far one of my favorite books. And I was thinking about how John was so specific that his very first mention of something that Jesus was going to do on the earth, his very first sign or mention miracle had absolutely nothing to do with the wedding even though it happened at a wedding and even though it benefited a wedding and even though there was a bride and there was a groom and there was a father and there were servants what miracle he brought had very little to do with what was happening at the wedding and the reason we know that is because when they ran out of wine according to John chapter 2 the Bible says that the wine ran out and Jesus' mom who also was attending the wedding showed up to Jesus and he's like hey bud now's your time and here's what I love about the contradiction and the tension of Scripture. If you read the Scripture itself, the Bible says that Jesus looked back at his mom and said, Woo, hold your horses. My time hasn't come. Y'all like my American side of that? You liked that, didn't you? Y'all like, what version is that? My version. He said, wait, my time has not come. And turns around in the very next instance after she says, do whatever he tells you. She's not convinced about whatever it is he's just said. And when he turns around, he says, bring me the water pots. Now, this would have felt very contrary and completely unrelated because there was no reason when you run out of a bottle, you would fill up a water pot. Water pot was full of water. Water was for cleansing. Water was for purification. It made no sense to the natural mind on if you were going to try to put something back in what was now empty, why you would do it in a new vessel. Why is it that you would choose what has been emptied to disregard and fill up something that has never even been used in this manner? And the reason is, is because John wants us to understand something from the beginning of time. That Jesus did not come walk the planet so that he could make us feel better. He did not come walk the planet so that we could know there were miracles. He did not come walk the planet just so that we could say we had a God who knew our infirmity. He came and walked the planet because he filled up six water pots which is the number of man with the purification that was used to pour out to cleanse people so it was an indication to us that if I show up at your wedding and you run out of something and you don't have what you need the way I fill you back up is through the cross six is the number of man he fills it up fills the cleansing tank with blood and then he pours it out and the people who benefit are all the ones who showed up to the party it's a sign to help us understand that from the beginning, his endeavor on the earth was not to make us happy, was not even to bring us into some kind of purpose, some kind of gifting. It was to bring reconciliation to broken people. He's all about reconciliation. So as a result of that, we have to go into looking at any time we talk about relationships. We can never look at relationships without looking through it through the image of the cross. Because the cross is the number one place of what it looks like to have restored relationship on the earth. It is the number one symbol of what it means to have restored relationship on the earth. No matter where you go, we have wonderful Brazilians that now attend this congregation. Woohoo for Brazil! Yeah, there you go. No matter where you go in Brazil, if you are in the capital cities of Brazil and you see on a mountaintop the great big Jesus that is looking over the entire city of Rio, why is that? Because there needs to be a symbol that helps to continually keep in front of us that Jesus did not just come as a man. He came as an example of what it looked like to restore healthy, whole relationship. He came looking for us. So in light of that view, I want to talk about three things real quick. Three things that every relationship faces. Three sometimes questions or sometimes things we need to process in us so that we better understand. Here's the first one. The first thing is, is you have to know in a relationship what to do with offense. 
you have to know what to do with a fence. Now, I love getting it. My dad used to say, this is good hunting ground. You know, when everybody gets real quiet, like, what you going to say next? I, I have real confidence in this area because I saw my dad live in it so often. What to do with a fence. Now, I want you to turn to, to Luke chapter 17 because I want to make some things really clear for you real quick. Luke chapter 17. This is Jesus speaking himself. When you get it, you can pull it up. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. Now, just stop there for a second. I'm going to move on in just a minute on my verse, just a second. I want to stop here for a second because these are Jesus' words. Okay? This isn't our interpretation of Paul's words. This isn't what we think he meant. This is Jesus' words. Jesus' words were, it's impossible. He himself, God, the God of impossibility, the God who said nothing is impossible to me, nothing is impossible to you if I'm living in you. He is the very person in this scripture who said, it is impossible that you don't have the opportunity to be offended. And you know why he said that to his disciples? Because he was responding to a relationship challenge. He was saying to his disciples that if you're going to be in relationship, you better believe that whether you're married, whether it's your kids, whether it's your parents, whether it's your best friend, whether it's your high school buddy, no matter who it is, it will be impossible that you do not have the opportunity to have offense. But the word offense there is not the sin of offense. The word offense there means temptation. And this is what he was trying to say to his disciples in verse 1. He was saying to them, if you don't understand that offense in itself is not the sin, but it's the temptation to sin. So therefore, if you don't know what to do with it, you will find yourself misusing it and not putting it into its proper place. And as a result of it, open up your life to more than what was just an offense. Don't be deceived, he's telling them. It's impossible that the temptation to be offended doesn't come. But offense in and of itself is not sin. It becomes sin when you act upon it in unrighteous ways. So what do you do with offense when it shows up? Keep going. Verse 2, we're going to read a few and it will be better for him to have a millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Keep going. Take heed to yourselves if your brother sins against you. Rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you, how many times? Okay, all of you are in here. Seven times. In a day. Hold on. In a day. Ain't none of y'all real people. In a day and returns and says I repent you shall forgive him now I love this this is verse 5 and I'm gonna go there now this is Jesus he has just given all this to his disciples now I love this bit this is my favorite bit people preach this wrong all the time I'm about to help you this is what he said and the apostles said to the Lord increase our faith now people Look at that scripture and they separate it from one another. They believe that verse 5 is the beginning of something new. When it's truly the word and. So it's the continuation of a previous thought. And here is what God is trying to say to us through Jesus and through scripture. It is impossible that you don't have the opportunity to be offended. In fact, you could be the very one who brings it and the one who receives it. Woe to the one who keeps going after it to constantly be the one that offends people. But if you are or if you're the receiver of it, here's your responsibility to it. And he said it was such demand and such command that the only reaction the kid, the guys that were with him could have is, Oh my God, this is terrible. Increase my faith. Make it better for me because I cannot figure out how that's okay. That's verse 5. 
Increase my faith. So there's a direct connection of something here. Because the word faith there is not faith to move mountains. It's faith to believe God's in control. And this is what he was saying. Offenses will come. Learn not to act on them. And when you learn to forgive, you're better for it. And this is what the disciples realized. What's keeping me from my ability to do that best is not necessarily more love. It's not necessarily a greater amount of joy. What's keeping me from that is truly believing you've got my best interest in mind, God. That if somebody does me wrong, I'm not the one that has to go and make sure that they've done me right. What you do with offense. Number two. Y'all okay? Y'all getting something out of this? I hope so. Number two. We have to learn how to carry a burden without carrying their load. We have to learn to carry a burden without learning to carry their load. Go with me to Galatians chapter 6. I love using this scripture because I, I want to show you something specific. My husband's going to help me in just a minute. In Galatians chapter 6, this is what it says in verse 1. We're going to read it through 5. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you are spiritually to restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks of himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So hold on, stop right there. Verse 1 through 3 tells you automatically that you have a responsibility to bear burdens, but he gives you the attitude in which you're supposed to do it in. He's telling you, you don't do it like you're something, because you're not the something. You're simply the carrier of who I am into their something. That's what he's telling them. So you got to keep yourself in the right perspective in verse 4. Or, yeah. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Verse 5. For each one shall bear his own load. Now these feel like tense verses that don't make sense to one another. Because in verse 1, 2, and 3, you're told to bear a burden. And in verse 5, you're reminded that you only are responsible for your load. But you have to understand the context of the two words. In the verse that talks about the burden, that burden is talking about something that is too heavy for you. In other words, it's like when you go to the grocery store and you walk out of the grocery store and you're carrying, maybe you're not like me, but I try to put the cart back before I get to, anybody else out there? <laughs> try to put the cart back so you just try to load it up. I mean, I look like the crazy person at m and all the time. Because I got like bags here, bags here. In fact, I've bought new bags because they go under my arms. So I can get all the way to my car without having to walk back my, my trolley. But there was a chance, and this happened to me a few months ago. Actually, it was pouring rain, and I had this same philosophy, and I was doing it with such amazement. I was really proud of myself, and I was headed back. Jason wasn't here. He was still in the States in June and in May, and I was headed back, and my bag dropped. Now, of course, my first reaction was, they better, I better not have put the apples on the bottom. Like, this is my first brain thought. And I went over to get it, and a nice little gentleman who had just parked down the way ran over and grabbed my bag and said, where are you going? And I said, I'm, I'm headed, you know, I'm headed to my boot. And he said, oh, great, I'll come with you. And he walked over with the two bags I dropped, and we put them in my car. I'm going to use this as an example, and then I'm going to give you a biblical one. The example is this. Are those bags mine? Yes. Nobody's going home with them but me. Because the man picked them up, he did not believe they belonged to him. He didn't say, oh, man, I'm helping you. Oh, no, take these. Don't worry. Whatever's in them, I'm fine. <laughs> Why didn't he do that? Because he didn't come along to try to take my load and carry my load that were my responsibility, the things I had paid for, the things that belonged to my family. He came along to help me bear a burden in a moment that something was too heavy for me to a place that we could both let it down that belonged to me. 
Now I'm going to give you a biblical example. Are you all okay? Genesis chapter 12. Come on, honey. You can help me. You can bear a burden with someone. It means heavy. It means heavy. But the word load is the same word that is used for burden in Matthew 11. When it says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The word burden there is the same word for load that we're reading about in Galatians. It means agile and made for you. Let me have this first, babe. Thank you. You're so awesome. Thank you, baby. Okay. Yeah, not yet. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Stay in your lane, love. <laughs> My load is like this key. It belongs to me. When I received Jesus, my potential changed. The unlocking of who I am can be wrapped up in this example of this key. This key is like my load. It belongs to me. It doesn't even belong to Jason. It belongs to me. The only person who will stand before the Lord for this load is me. The only person who has to give an account for this load is me. I never get to stand at an altar before the Lord and say, well, you had no idea what it was like being married to him. Because the Lord is going to say, how about your load? And what did you do to let other people help you carry the burden so that you never lost sight of your load? But what I find is, is that though this is our load, that sometimes we end up believing, letting, and sometimes even acting like that this load belongs to someone else. So though it's ours, everything about it is ours. It cannot be given away because it doesn't belong to anyone else. It is my life. In other words, what I choose every day is about me. I can't look at it through the eyes of a church. I can't look at it through the eyes of my last name. I can't look at it through the eyes of my office or my gifting. I have to make choices that affect my life, what I watch, what I say, what I do about me. No matter what happens with y'all, I have to watch for me. But there are so many times that we do one of two things. We walk over to people we love. We get married. And we say things like this. Carry my heart well. Do well. Care. And then Jason says, well, hold on. Hold on. I'm, I, I want to be in relationship. That's what we are. But I got my key. You got yours, girlfriend. I can't, I can't be your everything. But when, we, when we're unfulfilled in our life and we don't understand the difference between getting married and having someone bear our burden and someone carrying our load, we get married and we start letting our spouse be our load bearer, not just our burden bearer. So before long, we have a complete codependency on their opinion on what they're doing. We won't go to things unless they go. We won't talk to people unless they're there. We won't talk in a crowd unless we know they're going to be beside us. Don't even act like I'm not preaching good. <laughs> and then sometimes, and this is the biblical example, sometimes it goes the opposite way. When the person who is holding their key who has a hold of their own key, and someone like Genesis chapter 12, when the word of the Lord comes to Abram and says to Abram, Abram, get out of your country. Now, don't you just love that? From your family, from your father's house to a land I will show you. Now, don't we love to preach that? Oh, man, oh, we love this bit. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in all your families of the earth, you shall be blessed. And so Abram departed as the Lord spoke, taking Lot with him. You're Abram. Taking Lot with him. Now, here's the important bit. The Bible is very clear about God's instruction. 
His instructions were, leave your family, leave your father's house, leave everything behind. You pick up your family and you go where I will show you. But Abram decided to add on to that and said, yeah, okay, I get it, God. But I'm going uh, to just carry, I'm just going to carry a, just going to take Lot along because, you know, his dad doesn't treat him good. And so he needs somebody. And, uh, you know, I don't have an heir. This is all in the Bible, by the way. I'm not repeating my own words. This is all in the Bible between chapter 12 and chapter 14. I'm, i I got to have somebody to give this to. And so, you know, there's nobody else. I don't have a baby. So I know what you said, God, but I'm certain you're going to bless me anyway because you said you were going to. So, you know, a half truth, a half lie, a half obedience, what's the difference? I'm just carrying around him with me. I didn't bring everybody. I only brought one. He is sort of like an orphan. He's my brother's son, but if you only knew how he was treated, you would understand why I had to bring him along until chapter 13. When the Bible says that Lot and Abram's servants begin to have strife among them and they cannot get to a place of agreement and Lot chooses the better land, gives Abram the worse land and before and after that there was a constant battle by the offspring of Lot with the offspring of Abram for the rest of eternity to now because Abram carried someone else's key. Just because you think it's okay today, there is a reason why you don't carry someone else's key. Because you see now, God sees the end of the story. He said, leave Lot. I got Lot. He's got his key. I'm in him. I got him. I got him taken care of. You've got to know, thank you, baby. You've got to know the difference. Yeah, well done. You've got to know the difference between carrying a key that does not belong to you and bearing a burden in a moment that someone needs help. Burden bearing does not come with stress because it's connected to the gifting, the call, and the skill that belongs to you. If I know how to get out of debt, and I've gotten out of debt, and I'm standing in front of someone who says, oh my gosh, I am completely piled on with debt. If I walk away from that conversation and never offer one tip on how to get out of debt, one absolute understanding of what it took from me, I did not bear their burden. But if I walk away from that meeting, and I go home, and I say to my husband, oh, you know what, so-and-so's got debt, I think we should go pay it all off. Now, I didn't bear the burden but I'm trying to carry the load. Doesn't mean you shouldn't pay those off occasionally, but I'm trying to give you the principle. The principle is you don't hold anyone's key. You hold yours. And there's only room in your pocket for one. So if you're carrying someone else's, I can absolutely hands down tell you, you are letting yours down. Because you don't have the capacity to carry loads that have not been assigned to you. Are you, are you okay? All right, I'm rounding the corner because I'm trying to keep it light. Relationships light. <laughs> Number three. But I am not going to let us not grow. We got to grow. Number three. Forgiveness flows from your view of the cross, not your view of a situation. Forgiveness flows from your view of the cross, not your view of a situation. Now, I'm going to give you a personal example with this. Jason had a massive car accident seven years ago. It was not his fault, and it was negligence in every way. The driver who was driving had made many poor judgments. He was non-compliant to following the road uh, obligations that he was under in his lorry. He missed all of the things he was supposed to do. He did not tackle his equipment correctly. He did not stop when it was smoking. He, did, he was on his phone when he was not supposed to be. He did not answer the phone when the company was calling because other cars were calling to say that he was smoking in the back of, his, uh, back of the truck. There were many things that made him negligent. He was a very evil man. When we had to go into situations where he was at, he had gone on the run to Mexico, couldn't even be found for the trial. 
Now, nobody would like to have done that. Jason and I did everything we could to avoid the necessities, but sometimes in America, there's nothing more you can do than to follow the system in that way. And in our case, I will never forget actually at first being two things. One, incredibly angry with him. Because, see, I'm a person who my core value, one of my core values is stewardship. So when I feel that somebody doesn't steward something they've been given well, it frustrates me. Like, it just frustrates me to the core. That's not like some God thing. That's just a me thing. And it frustrated me that somebody would get in the back of their lorry doing something on a public motorway and not care enough about other people to watch what he was doing. It made me feel that he was selfish. And that made me mad. And I will never forget, Jason was in a, he was in a, he couldn't even come to the table to eat dinner for a year. He was completely out of any communication. I was doing everything. It was, it was such a difficult time. And even past that, it really took a good four or five years to get everything back around, wasn't it, honey? They said he'd never golf again. I'm so thankful he does. All kinds of things. One day he'll tell you his story. But I remember for me, I got a phone call from a friend. We were headed to having to figure out where this man was. He was in Mexico, it was awful, he was unwilling, he, he was pleading that nothing was guilty, he wasn't guilty at all, even though everything had been proven. And I got this call from a friend who said, I'm calling to pray with you. And she did, she prayed with me on the phone, and when she was done, she's a pastor, she's a, a, a pastor's friend of mine. And she said to me on the phone, she said, okay, um, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to pray now too for the man. I said, yeah, I got a few prayers. Bring it, Lord! The wrath of God! She said, I would assume that you want to go in to the courtroom today with a pure heart of forgiveness. And that I'm sure that the best way to do that for you is probably to pray and bless him now. Oh, man. Conviction just gutted me. Because I realized I had been making a choice on a man's life not through the cross, but through my situation. And in that moment, God rerouted me. And he reminded me that if I'm going to be a person who lives up to what I believe God has said about me, then I have to live my life from the perspective of the cross. So no matter what situation comes to me, I choose to make my choices from it through the view of the cross. I cannot forgive, let me help all of us, we don't have the capacity to naturally forgive. It's not in us. That's not a natural thing. Go into the world. Jesus said what makes us different is that we do forgive each other. We do keep showing up and doing life with each other. That's what he said. He said that's what's going to set you apart. But if you don't see through the cross you will always see through your version of the situation. Hebrews 2, I'm around the corner, I'm coming too close. Hebrews 2 tells us, and you don't have to pull it up, it's okay, I'm just going to, well, okay, it's there now. No, go ahead, you're there now, it's fine. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Keep going. For both he is sanctified and those who are being sanctified are all one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here and I am with the children whom God has given me. Now stop there. When you read this in other versions, the word brethren there, there means my family. This is what he was saying. It pleased me to make the cross my place of viewing you. I went to the cross to view something different about you. That's what Jesus was saying. And he said, and you know what I got when I went there? I came back happy, thrilled, genuinely excited that you were my family. The very people that he is speaking to are some of the very people who mocked, who killed, who unrighteously conveyed, 
what they thought in lies and territorialism, on his word, on his nature, on his integrity. And he said, no matter all of it, when I got to the cross, I started viewing you. And here's what he's telling you and I. He said it in Colossians 3, my opening scripture, and I'm rounding it out. He said, you must forgive because I forgave you. You know what that means for you and I? The word forgive there does not mean excuse. Doesn't mean to look at them and go, they didn't make a mistake. That word forgive there means to be gracious anyway. To be gracious anyway. See, there are some situations that I know are in your life. And they give you a thousand reasons. Like me with a truck. Legitimate reasons. Why I should despise, write off, hate, get angry, believe I'm right, get judgmental. Whatever is the word. But when you see your situation through the cross, you are reminded at just how broken you actually are. We are self-righteous when we believe that we're still not not in need of a cross. I wake up in need of a cross. I go to sleep knowing I'm just me. There's been a few times in the last few weeks I've pulled my car right over here. People probably thought I was insane. Jason wasn't even with me. And I just got out of my car and came and sat on these seats in the middle of the heat, sweating the fool. I said, God, I'm just a human. I don't know what you know. I can't do what you can do. These people are only your people. I stewarded them the best of my ability, but I'm just a human. But I'm viewing every situation through the cross so that my graciousness abounds. Not because people don't hurt you. Not because that man didn't cost my husband part of his life. But because at the end of the day, I know me. And I know how much I have needed Jesus. I know what it's like to sit in the back room somewhere and not know who you are. I know what it's like to get up and not think you're getting it, doing it well. I know what it's like to to leave a bar and feeling bad about myself or say something to my husband that I know wasn't right, not understanding why that vileness can come out of me. I know these things because I'm human. But when I view my situation through the cross, I'm more Christ-like than any other time in my life because he views you and me the same way. I have his view now, not mine. Do you know what's gonna restore relationships? Not figuring out who's right or wrong. There's always wrong, there's always right. What restores relationships is when we go, truthfully, we're all wrong. Everyone. And I don't get there by coming up with 19 reasons why my pride needs to be propped up. Because you know what pride does in a relationship? It reminds everybody that you believe you're more important in the moment. But when humility gets in, I'm wrong. Sure I am. I'm sure I've done things that have hurt you. I can't tell you the countless meetings over my life I've sat in and looked at people and said, I'm sure I've failed you. I don't want to fail you. I don't wake up in the morning trying to fail you. I don't go to work trying to fail you, but I'm sure I have because I'm a human. But if I have, I want you to forgive me because I don't want failure to be the gap between you seeing I want you and I to live graciously. 